Jewel of the Cat Goddess, and of Eons and Stars story featuring the voice talents of Lothar Tuppen, Pete Lutz, Jerry Eliff, Frank Guglielmelli, and Rand Moritzki. Written and produced by Chauncey Haworth. And now, Jewel of the Cat Goddess, Episode 1, The Temple of Bastet. Are you familiar with the story of eons and stars? It's a story that spans time and space. A story that could start at any moment. A story that could start anywhere. For this mere modicum of the complete saga, we must travel to the future to hear a tale from the past. We join Professor Jonathan Whateley as he does what some old men do so well, and even more do so very poorly. And that is tell a story from his youth. Our venerable professor is at Ultima Verbi, the only bookstore left in Arkham, reading from his latest, and with any luck, the last book of his life, disappointingly titled, Just Waitly. The man is gaunt and old, and the audience even more so, but retirement to a man such as this might as well be death. And nothing scares an old man who's looked death in the face more than the prospect of seeing it again. Welcome to Ultima Verbi the last refuge of the written word in Arkham. Tonight's guest speaker is Professor Jonathan Waitley, renowned archaeologist, occultist, and philanthropist. While he may not need any introduction for those with knowledge of mystic lore, for the rest of you, the professor has been connected to many a story throughout the history of our area. Some with positive outcomes, others that the mainstream considers to be quite dubious. But to us, the learned in the ways of the real world, the professor is a hero. Discovering new truths and keeping us safe from the terrors of the beyond, without further ado, your rake canteur for the evening, your fabulist of voracious fables, friend to Ultima Verbi, the last refuge of the written word, I give you Professor Jonathan Waitley. Thank you. Thank you, Percival. That was an unwarranted and energetic introduction. And thank you all for coming out this evening. I will be signing copies of the book after the reading and answering questions if you are interested. One advantage of a small attendance is that it looks like I'll be able to sign all of your books. (laughs) Tonight I will be recanting The Jewel of the Cat Goddess, the fourth chapter in the book. Probably not verbatim, just a bit from the page and a bit from the old memory. I have lived a life of stoicism. Or so I have thought. My late friend, my best friend, Charles Caldecott Charters, ah, my dear Charles. Charles always told me that my own impression of myself was a lie. And I would like to believe him. The mere idea of sharing my stories with the world would have been a joke to me. But ever since Charles and before Charles, my sweet wife Nora... Since they passed, it has been my goal to live life not just for myself, but for them as well. It's not that they want their stories told. I just assume they enjoy laughing at me from up there somewhere. Well, enough of this melancholia. Let us proceed with the adventure. There are many out there that blindly believe what I have written. There are even more that will logically deny it. But I assure you that I am the most honest man that has ever lived. And... At the same time, the most depraved of liars. Somewhere between the top and the bottom of my words lies the truth of it all. Chapter 4, Jewel of the Cat Goddess. It may be hard to believe that I was once a younger man. We all take that sight for granted. We see the venerable and the crippled. We see them as old. We know they were young once. But do you really picture the face? The story begins when I was fresher faced than I am now. 
My dear Nora was still alive, and Charles served us and our family well as my assistant, chauffeur, and overall adventure companion. I was the newest in many generations of the Waitley family to pursue the darker secrets that the world has to offer. Some Waitley sought power, others freedom, others money, and they all succeeded, leaving my generation with all three. So I sought all that was left. Obligation. An obligation to my family name, and an obligation to my father's legacy. It was this obligation that led Charles and me on a quest to Egypt, deep into the western desert, to find a jewel. The jewel of the cat goddess Bastet. Many of my family's quests were generational. This one was no different. It started with my great-grandfather first hearing the tales of the cat goddess's jewels that could restore vigor to even the most gravely wounded. Next, my grandfather learned to translate the hieroglyphics on scrolls and tablets to learn how and where to look. When age took my grandfather, my father combed the sands of northern Africa looking for the way, and he found, found it in a map at the depths of the, an ancient tomb. He and the map made it home, but my father never recovered from the trip. So I was left with the map, the knowledge, the resources, and the duty. I was honor-bound to my ancestors' vaingloriousness, an affliction I too had inherited. Charles and I landed in Cairo and prepared our party for the adventure ahead. First came the money, then the train. There's always a train involved if you're in the east. Then a caravan of camels. <laughs> it was myself and Charles, a company of men led by Mulazim, a lieutenant in the Egyptian army, and our guide, Abdul al Hazred known in the company of locals as Abdul the Mad Arab. I'm not entirely sure he was an Arab, being an American and young at the time. My only real guides to a person's ethnicity or creed was their skin tone, their name, and their language. Abdul's skin was dark, as was common in that part of the world. But his language? He spoke many, but he spoke them all with a slight accent that I could not place. He was adept at every language our party spoke, Yet it was generally agreed that none were his native tongue. I have no problem trusting a man different from me. In fact, I pride myself on being a good judge of character. I did not trust him because of his eyes. Every time we spoke, he was two sentences ahead in his eyes. Every dune we saw, he saw two dunes further. I looked at him as a man with his own agenda. And nothing is more dangerous to a mission than when one man has a separate agenda. While I did not trust him, he did what he said he would do. He got us to the entrance of the Temple of Bastet. The wind was sharp, and the grains of sand stung our skin as we gazed upon a long wall with a large stone door in front of us. Professor, how will we get inside? Should we blow it open? No, Charles. That could take much more down than intended. We'll have to investigate further. Send a group north up the wall, and a group south to see what we discover. Here, Professor. Professor, Abdul has found something. What have you found? My god, it's like a keyhole in the stone. Astonishing. Rimmed in metal, even. Iron, maybe? How is this possible? We could try to pick it up, or pull it open with a caravan. No. Here. Look. Abdul said to us, pulling an iron key from within his dark cloak. The key was a simple key, not European, but of normal design in the teeth, but the bow of the key was long and flat, with strange markings unlike any hieroglyphics or form of cuneiform I had ever seen. Abdul twisted the key in the lock, and there was a loud echoing click, followed by appurtenant gears and clicks echoing through some cavernous space hidden beneath the sands. We worked together to heave the door open. But much to our surprise, the stone wall slid to the side easily, almost deliberately. My god, Charles. What have we discovered? It looks like we have discovered what we sought, the Temple of Bastet. But I warn you, Professor, Abdul seems very eager to enter. I'm going to follow behind so I can watch both your back and his actions. Good man, Charles. Light the torches once inside. It's gonna get dark fast. My god, is this even Egyptian? 
I'm not sure. The walls are covered in hieroglyphics, but nothing I recognize. There's a sharpness to them. It's hard to decipher if they're pictographs or sigils. Look at this one. At one moment, it appears to be some form of sharp-edged letter, and at the next, a mountain and a stream, maybe? They are very old. And how do you know that, Abdul? Abdul did not answer Charles. He just looked away and carried on. As I said, we were younger then, and none more so than Charles. Fresh from the military, he was a hardened body with a keen mind, not a person one would want an altercation with. He was an Adonis. We delved deeper into the tunnel. What started out as oddly large soon grew to a massive hallway, easily 50 feet across, and several men high with gold ornamented pylons, columns, and statues. With vibrant paint and intricate detail, Finally, the hall opened up to the temple's court, lined with massive columns that ten men could barely wrap their arms around, incited by lavish sitting areas. Beyond that, the hypostyle, with urns, bowls, and deteriorated fabrics, lined the walls, and beyond, we could see a faint light coming from the sanctuary. The sanctuary room was vast and bare, with a single beam of light shooting from its vaulted ceiling, casting a glow upon an altar with a single yellow jewel. Flanking the altar were lines of cat statues, stretching out, large to small, lions, tigers, jaguars, all the way down to cats no larger than the common house cat. Oh, it's, oh, it's more, more than, than I could have imagined. imagined. It's, more it's more than, than anyone, anyone could have imagined. imagined. The, the Eye of Bastet. Bastet. Professor, we should, we should set up camp outside, outside and then investigate, investigate further. further. We don't know if there are traps or how structurally sound this place is. Yes, Charles. Good idea. You men there. Let's get camp set up and supper going. Then we can start planning the excavation. Finally, it is mine. As we turned our backs to leave, Abdul grabbed the jewel. We turned to see him throw what appeared to be some kind of glittering sand from the arm of his cloak into the faces of the company men closest to him, and they instantly fell to the ground with shouts of pain as Abdul made a dash for the exit. The men writhed in pain and went quiet. Charles and I went after Abdul, up through the hypostyle and the court. Behind us, the men who'd fallen to Abdul's spell started to rise and attack those that were unafflicted. The beam of light flashed brighter and darker as the hole above started to open allowing the desert sands above to start filling the sanctuary. Keep going, Professor! I chased on, catching up on the heels of Abdul, Charles right behind me, and several of the men behind him. Behind them, a snarling mass of twisted soldiers with dead eyes and bloodied hands and mouths. The sand was pouring in from behind us, and blowing in from the entrance, burying our feet deeper and deeper with each step. I dove and grabbed Abdul's feet, tripping him down into the sands, the jewel flying from his hand toward the exit. No! Spitting sand from my mouth, I crawled over his pleading body towards the jewel. Abdul got to his feet in pursuit, but was immediately stopped by the force of Charles hitting him in the back of his head with the butt of his rifle. I tripped and crawled, trying to get to the quickly closing exit when I felt Charles's titanium grip grasp my shirt collar and drag me out of that collapsing tunnel. Charles threw me into the sand by the caravan of camels and turned back to help whatever men he could, but it was too late. Their cries were abruptly silenced by the collapsing of the sands into the temple. It took three days of steady riding for us to return to the city, but little did we know that acquiring the jewel was not the quest. The quest to keep the jewel, and our lives, was just beginning. The meager crowd at the bookstore reading stared on in awe. Some believed, most did not, but all wanted our dear professor to continue. As the evening weather outside started to howl, of course, our hubristic and entitled professor obliged them. But for that, You'll have to return for the next episode of Jewel of the Cat Goddess as the Professor and Charles fight to stay alive against the Cult of Sekhmet. <laughs>